Welcome to Be Forgotten, Season 2, Episode 1, A Young Man's Ambition. Ambition. In the eyes of some, nothing changes the world more than it. Some loathe it as a form of egocentrism. Some admire it as the passion of a great character, like Napoleon said. In the history of the 20th century, and of course in the history of the world before and after, ambitious men have changed the world as we know it countless of times. Some of them, from the dictators and still absolute monarchs to the leaders of the free world, are well known and in everyone's mouth. Yet some have managed, or been condemned to, a small historical existence, riddled with lies, over-exaggerations and inaccuracies. It is rather surprising, because more often than not, they had a great effect on their time. The first season of this podcast dealt with August von Gneisenau, a young nobleman who set out to reform the Prussian army and state alongside other great men. This second season will shift its view to the new world, and a character born 57 years after Gneisenau's death. A man whose legacy has been one of great importance, as he founded a dynasty which had enormous influence in the United States, although it would suffer one gruesome tragedy after another, the Kennedys. Before I start this series, I have to say a few words about it. First and foremost, I want to thank listener Northfield, no, not his real name, for the idea. When I made the survey on Facebook, I must admit that I did not have an American character in mind, so having a chat on Discord, I asked him for any ideas. Thankfully, he had one, and I do consider it quite great. Secondly, I want to bring the sources I have used to your attention. Those will be listed under the sources category on my website, theforgottenpodcast.wordpress.com. Thirdly, I'd like to inform you about my outlets. This show will appear on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes and Stitcher. I've decided to stop uploading the videos on Facebook, since I do not believe anyone really listens to a podcast on Facebook, but I will of course keep you informed about any episode there. The man I want to spend this season on is Joseph Patrick Kennedy, commonly referred to as Joe Kennedy, born on September 6th, 1888 in Boston, Massachusetts, to Patrick Joseph Kennedy and Mary Augusta Hickey. Patrick Joseph, P.J. Kennedy, was the son of an immigrant from Ireland, Patrick Kennedy. This Irish heritage would come to shape both Joe Kennedy's youth and his political career. Patrick Kennedy, the grandfather, had emigrated from Ireland sometimes in the mid of the 19th century, probably 1848 or 1849, for the reason so many left the Emerald Isle in centuries past. Hunger. Catholic Irishmen migrating to the United States had not been a new phenomenon by then, but from 1820 to 1860 alone, almost two million Irishmen arrived in the US, which of course does not include those who did not survive the travel over the Atlantic in the ships which had the pretty meaningful nickname Coffins. Three quarters of those who arrived came during the Great Irish Famine from 1845 to 1849, caused by the potato blight, taking more than a million lives. It is assumed that, although we do not know that for certain, Patrick Kennedy of Dungenstown sailed for the States because of the same reason. His new home, East Boston, was in a state of economic rise. The island, referred to as Noodles Land sometimes, had been the target of massive investments during the 1830s by a group of people that intended the island to be a place for both vacation homes and wharfs, and during the 1840s it became a destination for most travel from Europe to the city. Patrick Kennedy was, according to the author of The Patriarch, David Nassau, who I have to name my main source, a rather fortunate Irish immigrant, as he was a cooper by profession, producing the barrels in which the goods produced in the town were shipped. So, in September 1849, he had already enough money to buy a house and marry. In 1858, the fifth child and second son, after the first had died from cholera when only two months old, Patrick Joseph P.J. Kennedy, was born... But Patrick Sr. did not have too much of his first surviving son. In November the same year, he as well died of cholera, although it is suggested that he had pretty much worked himself to death, as the Coopers in town had a working week of 72 hours. So we can assume that the cholera did just swipe up what had been left of this 
hard-working man. Bridget Kennedy, the widow, had to make ends meet for the entire family. She worked as a hairdresser and house cleaner, as well as renting out several rooms of the house they still owned, making a rather meagre living from it. Nonetheless, her son, PJ, was not sent to work somewhere at the harbour as soon as could walk, as you might have expected it. Instead, he went to school, at least for several years. How did that work? Well, the financial situation massively improved for Bridget Kennedy. Quitting her job as a hairdresser, she bought a store closely to the harbour from what Patrick had left her, and she quickly started to sell groceries and liquor to the workers from the port, earning a small fortune. Her daughters, of course, being cheap workers in the shop. In the 1880s, after working as a brass fitter for several years, at the age of around 20, PJ got a loan from his mother and bought several bar rooms close to the harbour. Those bars were, as his mother's shops, well situated, so that both sailors and workers would come and spend what little they made to have a nice evening once in a while. Long story short, PJ quickly made the money to jump into the business of importing liquor and made a lot of money out of it. The more decisive step of these young years was that he used his popularity, I mean, he owned a great bar, how can you be unpopular with that, and his fortune to become a local politician. As again according to Nassau, the Bostonians with American-born parents were already outnumbered by those with Irish-born parents in 1895. We can figure this trend has started way earlier. Even though the situation in Ireland stabilized, more and more people left the island after hearing how much better life was in the US. As US law permitted immigrants to apply for nationalization as early as five years after entering the country, only demanding that the person could speak English, which, obviously, the vast majority of the Irishmen was perfectly able to, although I can already hear the British listeners debating that claim, all those people were allowed to vote. And for whom did they vote? The largely Protestant Yankees? Hell no. They voted for people like P.J. Kennedy, Irish Catholics. The dualism between Yankee Protestants and Irish Catholics would shape U.S. politics, especially in the population centers in the North, for several decades. The majority of the Irish candidates, literally all of them, flocked to the banners of the Democrats. So it was rather unsurprising that of the 60% of immigrated Irishmen who voted, almost all voted for the Democrats. So in 1885, Patrick Joseph Kennedy was elected as a representative for East Boston in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, where he'd stay for five consecutive terms, each lasting one year. During this time, in 1887, he married Mary Augusta Hickey. But the great expansion of Irish power in the House of Representatives proved to be its undoing. Several anti-Irish Republican groups were founded, preaching that the Irish were if their steep increase in power would continue to grow, one day going to take over the country, and that the Catholic Church would overrun the country then, especially because they would cut funding of schools belonging to the state and instead flood the parochial schools with money. This went so far that in 1895, which Republicans formed the Immigration Restriction League, which strove for literacy tests for immigration, which many of the Irishmen arriving in the harbour would have failed. All this was, of course, the usual xenophobic chat that has always been used to extend the limits of your own power. But holy hell, did it work. In Boston, the school committee was filled exclusively with Republicans, as well as the new mayor being a Republican after the former, Hugh O'Brien, an Irish Democrat, was soundly beaten during his campaign. Yet the Irish Democrats learned from his defeat. Now, not only backing their own anymore, but also Yankee Democrats, not taking too close a look at their confession. In those times, in 1888, the first child, Joseph Patrick Kennedy, was born, followed by another son who'd die rather early, and two daughters which have never played a great role in Joe's life. So after digressing this much from the life of our subject, and spending so much time on explaining his backstory and heritage, let us finally jump right in. It is recorded that from his earliest days, as soon as he could think and speak for himself, it was his first and foremost ambition to do better than his grandfather and make so much money that his children, just like him, would never have to do any hard labor themselves. This ambition would shape his life right to his deathbed with his family in tatters. The Kennedy family was well respected and even more wealthy, and the parents could afford the best education for their son. 
testimony of his early years is very scarce, as Joe Kennedy did not talk too much about his boyhood in East Boston once he was rich and important enough to be asked about it. The first and most important step we have to look at is the education. His first years at the East Boston Assumption School, a parochial school, were coined by Catholic indoctrination. Still, the woke-up little boy learned a lot from his father. It is known that he spent a lot of time campaigning with him, watching the sessions of the Board of Strategy, an informal political institution his father presided over, which was intended to garner support for the Democratic candidates in Boston, and in general pestering his father with questions about each and anything having something to do with politics at all. To quote David Nassau again, which I will do a lot since his book is just a marvel of historical and biographical research, the Kennedys of East Boston would enter the new century with PJ granted a $5,000 salary by the city, equivalent to more than $135,000 in purchasing power today, and healthy incomes from his many business concerns. When Joe Kennedy left his home that fall to attend school across the inner harbor, he did so as the privileged son of one of East Boston's wealthiest, most powerful and most respected men. That fall was September 1901. Six days after reaching the age of 13, on September 12, he ferried across the harbour to visit the Scola Latina Bostoniensis, Boston Latin School. Researching a little on it has convinced me that this school is still one of the best, if not the best, in the US today, and so it was back then. Everyone who had absolved a high school or taken the entrance test was eligible for joining. Well, eligible. Everyone had to bring a letter in which his parents or guardians assured the school that they intended to give their child a collegiate education. This reduced the number of candidates immensely. Only few were willing and able to deny themselves the four years of wages the boys could have earned for them if they did not study, and way fewer were able to pay college tuition. That way, the school ensured that just the better families of the town could enjoy the privilege of their children studying there. The school was considered a stepping stone on the way to Harvard, and the education was rather hard. The humanistic curriculum, including Latin, Greek, English and French, as well as an almost a ridiculous bunch of mathematics and physics, made it safe to say that the majority of the students did not pass their classes and had to move to different schools. Joe really struggled during his school days. He was not exactly a diligent student, rather lazy. One of his classmates once remembered... It is said that Winston Churchill was near the foot of his class, and I think Joe must have tried to emulate that great other man, for scholarship was not a field in which Joe sought or obtained success. His great devotion was not to Ovid, Sallust, Xenophon or Homer, but sports. He was an award-winning batter, managed the football team and excelled at military drill, a mandatory subject at school. The mayor of Boston, a staunch political rival of his father and a man of great charisma, but even greater scandalous tendencies, the Democrat John Francis, Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, had a daughter named Rose. Joe, an attractive, trained and slim young man with a certain fiery attitude, was a ladies' man by definition, and he went to many dances with her, after making her acquaintance during a family holiday in Maine. She called that he was tall and thin, had a sort of reddish hair and wore glasses. He was a very good baseball player. He did not drink and he did not smoke, and that impressed me as a girl. And he was a very good, polite Catholic, which made an impression too. Soon both would fall in love. A love which would last through their days and would foster children which would become international stars of American politics. Yet still, he had to wait. Honey Fitz did not approve of the liaison, because she was, at 16 years, too young to go to dances, especially with the son of a political rival who was no more than a schoolboy. So, another ambition of young Joe was to impress the person he wanted to be his father-in-law. He had to spend an extra year at Boston Latin, because his grades were subpar, although he could have passed, and it was a decision of the school board to keep him, as he spent too much time with his sports and his romances, and they did not deem him ready for the Harvard exams yet. This extra year he still spent on romances and sports and extracurricular activities. He became colonel of the school, the head of military drill, as well as class president and first baseman, which, in my uneducated mind, 
is something rather good. I honestly do not have the slightest idea of baseball. His academic exploits, however, were still underwhelming. He scored a bunch of Ds, some Cs, but nothing else, still failing advanced Latin and physics, which he had to retake in his college freshman year. So Mr. Kennedy Jr. would finally go to Harvard, looking for fame and fortune and the ability to get the girl he loved. Wait a second. The last one is only half right. It is reported that Joe had, during his romance with Rose, lots and lots of girls, which was not at all uncommon back in the day. Even when he was married to her, he still had lots and lots of affairs. So do not imagine this romantic quest as a do-or-die thing, as he would have had many other options. But as Rose was considered the best girl, prettiest, smartest, and from the best family, it was quite obvious that a Joseph P. Kennedy would not shoot for anything lower than her. Thank you very much for listening to this. Thank you very much for listening to this second attempt on the first episode of the second season. I am greatly sorry for not having noticed how underwhelming the first recording has been until my girlfriend told me, and I hope this second attempt is more pleasant to your ears. Be sure to like, dislike, subscribe, comment, review or even support me on Patreon if you like to. I hope you are looking forward as much to next week as I do, when Joe finally goes to Harvard and starts working in a field no one had really 